Windrush generation are seen as those Caribbeans who came to Britain between 1948 to 1971. But what about their children and grandchildren of those economic migrants who came to Britain in search of a better life? This story is about migration of African Caribbeans who were invited to Britain in 1948 by the government and came to settle in Huddersfield, West Yorkshire. It's about their tears, laughter, hopes, aspirations and fears of bringing to light the challenges of navigating race and defining multiple identities in the celebration of their heritage, tradition, rituals, faith and culture. We hear authentically the voices of those economic migrants from the Caribbean and their children. They came with a suitcase or you know, they came with their, their um, little possessions um, and they came with a dream and they came with a vision. Uh, and there was the, there was the five year plan to work your money and then you're away for five years. I arrived here in Maine in 1956. The first carnival was in 1957. 1957, when I just come to Huddersfield. No job for black. That is the one that hurt. A struggle for freedom, a celebration of courage and resilience in spite of explicit structural and institutional discrimination. We learn how they navigated their way into British society and how the Huddersfield African Caribbean community remained resolute, determined and moving forward. Um, for many, um, they stayed and um, had children uh, and they, they achieve their, their goals through their children. Yorkshire and Huddersfield's connections with African descendants go back to Roman times. The renowned historian Peter Fryer quotes, Africans in Britannia. There were Africans in Britain before the English came here. They were soldiers in the Roman Imperial Army that occupied the southern part of our island for three and a half centuries. Among the troops defending Hadrian's Wall in the third century AD was a division of the Moors, Numerus Maurorum Aurelianorum, named after Marcus Aurelius, or a later emperor known officially by the same name. Originally raised in North Africa, this unit was stationed at Ambalava, now rough by sands, near Carlisle. Within the army regiments, there's been a black presence since 1715, and whenever regiments are deployed to Yorkshire, the black soldiers are with them. Uh, so black soldiers can be found serving in Yorkshire. Some black soldiers are already resident before enlisting, uh, and some black soldiers marry in Yorkshire and some black soldiers die in Yorkshire up to the 1840s. By black, the British Army at the time, black meant Afro-Caribbean, African, African-American and, and Asians as well. Uh, and their primary role was as enlisted musicians, so trumpeters, buglers, drummers and bandsmen. And, and in the past, uh, all orders are given by the sound of the drum, so any formation they have to change to in battle that's the responsibility of the black soldier to do. Um, in a cavalry charge, the black trumpeter would have to sound the charge and go alongside his officer. Uh, when they're being attacked by the enemy, the band stays behind the colour party and, and the music is absolutely imperative for communication. So wherever the British Army is and whatever orders it needs to give, um, it's frequently a black man that's giving those orders or that's relaying those orders. Uh, what you've got is a group of men who did raise their heads above the parapet and who did make difficult decisions. But what they do is they serve to give us a time where we were united. And the descendants of the black soldiers are still amongst us. And the safety that they fought for, we still enjoy. We just need to remember who gave us that. The effects of African enslavement can be seen in Huddersfield the Victorian mansion of Stone Lee and the former Greenhead House, where the town park and Greenhead College now flourish 
testify of past wealth that came from family-owned tobacco plantations in Tennessee. How did he fund this then? Well, as far as we know, from the proceeds of the of the business he was running in Huddersfield um, with his brother, which was this uh, the factory down bottom end of Fitzwilliam Street, Beaumont Street area. Okay. And where were uh, they getting their money from? Well, the tobacco was being imported from uh, their uncles, uh, who were plantation owners in Tennessee, in the southern states. And of course, Tennessee was one of the one of the slave states, um, and slaves worked the plantation. So this was how it was described as having been built without regard to expense. Are, are we implying to some degree that the money to build this and fund the factory was from the proceeds of um, enslaved Africans uh, working on the plantation? Sure, I mean that was the source of supply. I mean the, the essential product for uh, so obviously for cigars and other tobacco products is is tobacco, and yeah. that's how the tobacco was being grown, and that was that was part of the economics of that business. Yeah, absolutely. Prior to slavery being abolished in 1807, prominent African abolitionists, including Olada Equiano, toured Yorkshire towns to condemn the abominable trade. The illustrious African-American operatic singer and actor Paul Robeson delighted concert goers in Huddersfield in the 1920s and 30s. Caribbean islands' economies were in decline after years of war and colonial underinvestment. Coming to the mother country and working was an exciting prospect. The passing of the British Nationality Act in 1948, government-led recruitment and word of mouth attracted Caribbean workers. After the Second World War, uh, Britain faced a population crisis and a shortage of labour. Um, there'd been a report that said the British population was likely to decline um, and that that was going to have economic consequences. So in 1948, the government passed the British Nationality Act that enabled anyone who lived within the British Empire to come to the United Kingdom without a passport, uh, without any restrictions and there were around 800,000 people living in the British Empire at the time. So the 1948 Act is, is an enabling act. It's designed to let people in. Um, when they passed it, they didn't necessarily think that they were going to let in people of colour. They didn't necessarily think they were going to let in people who weren't white. Um, it didn't really occur to them what they were doing. It was awkward because when he came here at that time, you know, to get in properties and things like that, you couldn't get them, you know. So there was um, there was other people that had came came before him on the Windrush, right? And what these the West Indian people used to do, right? Certain ones would have a house, and once you came over, they put you up until um, until you could get your own premises and things like that and that's what they did that's how hard it was they just couldn't get, go out there and get their own properties so it was really hard when he first came over they had also had a royal commission on population and that had concluded that the british population was likely to decline um, and it largely thought in terms of people from europe coming to britain displaced people from the second world war but it did have the warning and this was a government-inspired report to have the warning um, that people who were different uh, were likely to find it more difficult to integrate in British society. Um, on the whole, they were thinking about um, Jewish people. Um, what they wanted was Christians to come to Britain. Um, of course, in large parts of the empire, particularly in the West Indies, um, substantial numbers of people were Christian, um, but they weren't white and so that would create problems for the future. They came by boat and later by plane. Caribbean workers gained local employment in the mills, factories and public services from the mid-1950s to the late 1970s. I um, came here on the 14th of February 1966. You know, because you got to remember they came from Jamaica, Trinidad, Grenada, Barbados, all over. And I thought 
we had landed, or they had landed the plane in an ice factory. Because I never knew that anything like ice could be on the ground. So when I went into my hotel room, because we stayed overnight, I wrote back to tell my mother that the plane landed in an in a ice factory because it was frosted over. There was a lot of taxes over here as well. You know, it was a, a lot higher cost of living, you know, to, to be in. And, the, and basically, they're in a foreign country. They don't know anybody, you know, um, compared to the little West Indies islands. You know, you've got big cities that are, cities that are bigger than the actual island. At first, I wasn't um, shocked. At first, it was amazement because I've never seen houses with chimneys. I've never seen smoke coming out of houses or fire in the middle of a house. Because I'm from Montego Bay, I think uh, all England was something like Montego Bay, uh, with a town. I didn't realize it was such a country town. So I was really disappointed when I came, but I wasn't gonna make that a problem to me. I had to live with what I had, and I did do. So it was an amazement, it wasn't a shock until when I started feeling the cold. Then the shock came and I wanted to go home, straight up. <laughs> because we spent like 18 days on the, on the ship coming over here. And when I reached here I thought, oh God, this place is black, yes? Didn't realize it at that time, it was winter time. I came in January and in, 1961, it was terrible, the, the, when, um, the winter was bad. I thought, oh, coming to England, England is, you know, the angel of everything, and, um, but it wasn't to be like that. They have, they have the fog, you can't see from here to there, the fog was so thick, you can't see. Because my dad lived in Huddersfield, we had to travel all this way and come in like it was never ending. It took us about six or eight hours to get up to Huddersfield. I didn't like it. I used to cry to go back home. I said, I don't like it here. I want to go home. And my auntie used to say, all right, then when you wake, we work your fear and then we'll, we'll help you. You can't go back home. I don't know if it's still um, called that. If your parents didn't have enough money, they send you to trust from the shopkeeper. So you, you go to the shop and you just say to the shopkeeper, Mama or Dad, I said, can you trust them? Can you trust them something, some um, food stuff until they get paid? And then when they get paid, they, they, they pay you. But after a while, you get used to it. And then when you start having your children, I meet my husband and then we have, uh, you, just, you just put your mind to your condition. But I didn't really like it. I didn't really like it. I didn't really like it at all. Um, but again, the ways here in England, comparison to the West Indies, it's, it's vastly different, Vast, or was vastly different. In employment, wages were lower for African Caribbean workers than for white workers, and unions were often hostile and resistant to change. Visible African Caribbean communities were formed in Dalton, Fartown, Deaton, Brackenall, Sheebridge, Hillhouse, Longroyd Bridge, and Crossland Moor. Well, in 1956, when we arrived here, the reception wasn't as well it is say like today because being black and uh, we wasn't classed as, you know, we got the no Irish, no dogs, no black treatment. So it definitely wasn't comfortable. I said, Dad, when he first came off here, what were it like? He said, babes, if I could have gone back on the boat, I'd have gone back. He said, when we wanted to go back, we couldn't because we didn't have the money. So a lot of the Windows generation had arrived in the war. Then a lot of them were demoed back to the Caribbean and came back including on the Empire Windrush itself and lots of other ships as well. And others stayed on, they didn't go back at all. I said, Dad, I said, but my brother was over there. 
and my mum had children over there of her own, she had three children over there of her own. I said, and they never came over here, and she said, because a lot of black families thought they could come over here, make some money, and send for the children, but they never, ever, ever had the money to send for the children. So that is why you've still got a lot of children in different parts of the Caribbean without their parents that stopped with their grandparents because they thought their life would be better over here. You get comment, the comment over and over again, but in wartime, it was different because you were wearing uniform. That's, what, that's one of the factors that changes. So because you were wearing uniform, you were part of the Allied cause, you were fighting with the British. So the hostility was much more muted and much less evident to people. First of all, they couldn't find anywhere to live. And then when they did find somewhere to live, they charged them extraordinary rents. They'd have five families living in one house, sharing one bathroom, sharing one kitchen, right? The rents that they charged them was absolutely over and above. After the war, people quickly forget that you were wearing uniform and you're now in civvies, so you're no longer seen as an ally you've become an immigrant. And so you seem quite differently. Uh, that's one of the comments they make. Another comment is, um, if they were in the forces, accommodation was provided. So they didn't come up against that sort of sharp end of racism that became very evident when the war was over. The only pub that my mum, my dad, or my mum could go in when they first came to this country was the Old Hat. And that was the only place that Irish and black people could go was the old hat. Having delved, delved into the archives um, here at Heritage Key at the university, um, revealing the very need for anti-discrimination committees, um, looking at tales of, um, of pubs in Huddersfield Town Centre on, in the suburbs, charging um, those non-whites um, more for, for a beer, something as, as everyday and, and normal as going along to a public house. There was a lot of depression within the communities. There was a lot of mental health. And my mum said also, because black men were very disempowered when they came to this country, think about it, they were in their country, right? Things might not have been good. They might not have had a lot of food over there, but boy, they had the sunshine and they had the freedom. And when they came over here, they didn't have the freedom black men was persecuted and I think that is why there became a lot of domestic violence within families and things like that. In Barbados in those days, uh, when it rained, you shelter from the rain, you know. And as I was coming up the hill, going up to the nursing home, um, um, it started to rain and I went, in, I went under this lady's porch to shelter from the rain and she came out and saw me. She said, what are you doing? This is in 1966, 67. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm sheltering from the rain. She went back inside, got a bucket of water, came back and threw it over me. And she said, you're wet now, off you go. The university student body um, petitioning to local members of parliament um, about um, black communities being told to sit in separate rooms, being, being divvied off in, in just one building. Now, that's one point. The point that follows on that from that is that I had no recourse. I couldn't go to the police, I couldn't go to anyone because the laws were not in, in, in place at that time to protect me. Um, excluding people from a public house because of their colour and their creed, it's, it's incredible and it's, it's, really, um, it's, really, it's really quite draining emotionally and quite shocking. And I had to go through those, those kinds of, of, of behaviours for years before the law came into place that I can go to the police and say, this lady did that or the other. Before, the police would have said, well, it's understandable. And they have always said that. When you begin look for a job, and every factory you go to, all is a sign, no job for black. That is the one that hurt. When they did get the jobs, they got the jobs, but their pay was lower 
right. They, cut, they, got, they got checked really badly. And um, you might go home and you're upset. And he said, tomorrow I'm going to go again. Thinking they would change their mind. My mum said she couldn't find none of her food over here. Nothing. She said they lived off eggs and, and a bit of rice for ages. And like they'd cook up corned beef. My mum said it wasn't until the late 70s really, that the West Indian food started to come, she, but it was very expensive. You go back and it's the same thing. And when you get fed up of going and see all that sign, you just decide, I'm going to go home and sit down and don't go nowhere until I, I myself decide that I'm going to work in a hospital. You know, the, you know, 50 years ago, you know, in our lifetime, you know, people having memory of um, this experience of not even being able to enjoy a pint, and um, and even when this was resolved or addressed by the brewers or by the local MPs and the, and the JPs, the fact that it's just still met by um, hostility and um, um, a very be begrudging manner, I think that was really shocking. That such an everyday activity could be so heavily um, racist. Couldn't go out certain time. When I just come in this country here, you couldn't go out certain time to these these young boys. What they call I forget what they call them now. I don't I don't really remember what they call them. They they would hurt you. They would hurt black people them days. So you got to be careful. And anybody would tell us, when you go, be careful. This was 19, 1967. It's 1967. Yeah. I went to council and I said, well, we, we, we entitled to a house and so I bring a crowd with me and everybody started to shake. And we had a good argument to them and after that, it's like they move everybody up Shipbridge. <laughs> All right, so that's how Shipbridge was formed. That's how it go, everybody up Shipbridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they broke down all the houses, where there's a car park now, where they're building new sports centre, broke down all the houses there because that's because all black people stay in that area. And they mix it up in Shipbridge, and that's how it happened. They could not get to mingle as often as they would like to do so they have to try to make their own entertainment and because of that i always wonder if one person can have four or five birthdays for the year because almost every saturday there is a birthday party so, you know so they they mingle with each other and and goes around and, and those who have homes especially and so on and, and they, I, I found it was quite okay but the only thing about it is sometimes they play music and it's loud and the neighbours they complain, the white neighbours. Yes. People of the Windrush uh, era, they came um, to work in the mills, work in the factories, work on the buses, um, work in the mines. Um, and wh when they came, they brought their aspirations, but they also brought their faith. And my mum said that church played a massive part in their lives it, when they came to this country. And a lot of black women that I've spoken to, I've done some research with black women, said that if they didn't have the church, they would have had nothing. They were people of faith, many were people of faith. And um, when they attended the, the local denominations, the um, well-known national denominations, um, there was a sense that they didn't feel they were welcomed. And so hence the need to look at places of worship where they could uh, define who they were and, and worship God. When I think about my mum and what my mum went through in this country when she first came over here, it hurts me and it still hurts me now. And how she had to struggle to bring her kids up. So the uh, the movement actually grew out of the need to um, spread the gospel, but also to fellowship with each other. 
By the 1970s, approximately 5,000 people from the Caribbean islands lived in Huddersfield. Britain's immigration laws of 1962, 1968 and 1971 dramatically changed the flow of Caribbean migrant workers coming into the country. Encountering discrimination at every level of society was a perennial struggle for the African Caribbean community. How did the first generations of arrivals in Huddersfield build a safe, strong community in the face of explicit discrimination and racism? You could apply for funding to, to run a project or whatever it is. And this is absolutely true because I've done it many, many times and you write out your project and you send it up to the, the council and you know for whatever you want to run and say for instance if you if you call it um, adopt a child or something just for, for namesake you get an answer back from the council to say your project wasn't accepted we set up the African Descendants Brotherhood Union okay. it's the papers that call us black power, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And why not, we're black. So there's no problem with that. Three months later, or thereabout, the council set up a project, and when you read it, it's all the things that you've put down is in that project and is somewhere else. This has happened so many times, over and over and over again. We start to preach. That was what's happening to us, what the police is doing to the youngsters, putting their head in toilets and flushing it, and beating them up and so on. I said, why is it that they never accept any of our projects and give, to give us any money, but it's always somebody else that is going to run it, that the council wants to run it? So we just got to try, carry on. We'll still um, apply for things, but we'll carry on and make the foundation for us. There was a heavy police discrimination against us and I, I suffer personally from that because I was in front. You know, we, and then we formed this little organization. The office was my car. <laughs> we used to get out of Vice, Vice Paro Park and the lads will come around, all the committee will come around and we make the discussion what we'll do next and so on. The Caribbean Association we were housed eventually, I can't remember what year it was, down at the old school, which was like an old Victoria, Victoria school. It was just off where used to be the open market, the Monday market. And finally, we got a house on Grove Street, number, number 51 Grove Street. And we organized from 51 Grove Street and from the first um, Caribbean um, community center. Black People's Community Centre. And we were in the in that school. Myse I myself um, was very much involved in setting up a, a self-aid scheme. Um, Mrs. Mrs. Smith, she did a lot of sewing for the for the self-aid scheme scheme. Um, that young lady who used to, I've gotten her name now, she, she did, um, she trained some of the girls in doing typing and things like that. She was in the office. Then we had a chap who did woodwork and we had other people who did other things. So we had about five different people doing different workshops. And Marley Lou was the prime was the was the um, council or was the representative at that time, I think. And um, he brought up the he brought up some of the councillors to come and see what we were doing. This time we were getting houses for people, we were getting things that happened to them, they'll come to us and and we'll um, we'll sort it out for them, the problems and so on. 
a lot of the people there sort of in my age group from different countries we didn't stipulate ourselves well I didn't anyway and many others didn't if you were Jamaican or Barbadian or Trinidadian you know you were all Jamaican you're all West Indians and you worked together from as early as the late 1960s sports teams were being created within the African Caribbean communities to tackle exclusion stereotyping racism and discrimination yes my dad he was a cricketer he, he loved he loved the sport so much um, and what he did when he came over he, he actually got a team going in the community as well we used to sit outside the Birmingham Fatan community center doing nothing all day nothing at all just sitting on the wall and at the time the shop across the road was owned by Buller Brothers it wasn't Baines it was Buller Brothers and they didn't like us sitting there sometimes but they were okay with us and a gentleman walked past who said um, he doesn't like what we're doing and he feels he can help us so we all laughed at him basically and says well if you can help us he says what would you want and this is something I do now he says what would you want and how can I help you those are the words he used I'll never forget that and we said we want to build the sound and we want to be well known in Huddersfield for playing music he says meet me here in two weeks time and we're going to start it for you we laughed at him but we were there two weeks time waiting you could guarantee anyone that came from the West Indies was a cricketer you know so they had them they had them all and basically what he did he um, he formed a Caribbean team, like the West Indian team of Yorkshire or something on that line. This chap pulled up in a minivan and took us somewhere. The man was called Mr. Stanley Innes. I'll never forget that, as long as he did. God bless his soul. As you can see on the photo, my dad's on the left. Um, Brian Chester's dad, Basil, um, is on the right. And Stanley Innes, who was a MP for Huddersfield in the Labour, he's there in the middle as well. And also on the back row, Mr. Hall, um, yeah, Mr. Lewis. You know, there's a, there's a good few of them there on there. And this, this photo signifies the people that were in the community, you know, around that time. And he brought us to Dewsbury. We thought we went somewhere like London. It seemed that far. And he bought us um, fane equipment. And he said he got the money through Princess Charles Trust. I'll never forget that either. And he says, right, what are you going to do with this when I give it to you? I says, one, it'll keep us out of trouble. And two, we love music. And that started us off. Many of those who came to Britain from Jamaica Barbados, Trinidad, Grenada, Caracol, St. Lucia and Antigua between the late 1940s to the 1970s now had British born children and it wasn't long before the history and stains of unrelenting racism was impacting on the now emerging British born African Caribbean descendants. I would say in about the 1977, 78, maybe 80s is around the time that my old lady started talking Seen to me things. about yeah, yeah skinheads walking down the street yeah. and um, be mindful of them skinheads because they're like black people and well, all them we spit after them. And I feel that a lot of black children were scared, but never said that, and was frightened about all the hostility that they used to feel and that. You're seen as different. You're treated different. You couldn't just go out and say you were going out and you were going to just go out with your friends because what would happen would be somebody would come in the car and go, nigger, black bastard, out of the car. You're kind of being alienated, you get me? And it can make you become a person really who you are not. In the 60s, it was like this. Um, we was always getting name calls, you know, called funny names like, you know, people telling us get back on your jam jar you know what did your mother used to do when she take, took you shopping lick your lips and slap you on the window you know you know we've got the nigger nigger taunts as well you know um we've got the black this and black that you know it was just constant you got used to it in a way when you look back on it you got used to it you got used to being persecuted because of your color you got used to being turned away at the shop or last in the queue to get your stuff. You got used to people staring at you. My 
generation before me, which is my mother who came here. They endured a lot of things in this country where my generation, when we came here, we wouldn't enjoy it, right? There came a time when we said enough is enough. Children were faced with difficulties within schools where teachers, classrooms and resources were completely unprepared. Uh, dispersal busing was something that very few people know about and when you tell people about it today they're almost always shocked to some degree. Um, it was a policy where uh, black and Asian children were bussed from areas where they were considered to be in too large a number um, to predominantly whiter rural areas um, and it was carried out in 10 other places, at least 10 other places around the UK. With our parents not understanding and knowing this, living in Long Rybridge, we was a mile away from school and after the first year, they transferred us to uh, various schools, Almondbury, which may be five miles away from where we lived. And I personally, I went to Rawfarp along with uh, the other uh, three people who lived close by who were uh, of the Gay family, Manswell, Enoch and Samuel Gay. And we had to catch two buses then to go to school instead of one bus. So I think that was a bit of uh, racial inequality, but our parents weren't understanding of that at that time. And neither was I because I was young. I was only 12. When I look back at the school curriculum, at the time, as a child, it felt okay. But as I grew, I got to understand that a lot was missing. How I would describe the national curriculum then, and I don't know if it's changed now, where the things we used to learn in school wasn't beneficial to me. Uh, I don't want to know about Tom Academ and, and certain things like that. And I don't want someone, how can I put this? How, I don't want a, an English white person, whether male or female, to be telling me about my ancestors um, and where they come from when they don't, they don't know themselves, you know what I mean? Which sometimes makes you feel so low in a classroom environment. We've got to understand that a lot was missing. A lot was missing. Relating to our... Um, the roots are history. For example, history class, I would ask regarding um, the history. Why are we not being taught about our history? And I was sent out of the classroom, shouted at and sent out of the class. So that showed me that, oh, there's something different going on here. So when you talk about Sissi, this takes me back now to when we used to play yeah. rugby yeah. and basketball and at football school. at school yeah. in these places. Listen, when them guys come over. Yeah, man. Listen, I remember going to Sissi and right down the corridor after the basketball match was one running back up with them, them boy from Sissi. From Sissi, yeah, yeah. Throughout yeah. the whole yeah. game, it was nigga this, nigga, nigga, that. nigga that. And you know, you know what I mean? Listen, this now, yeah, looking back at it, you've got the teachers, our teachers that are telling us, oh, just ignore it. Ignore it. Just ignore it. Just ignore it. And Some, you know what? It was hard to ignore, man. Hard to ignore. Somebody came and said to me that um, the teacher kicked Clifton. He was playing football. I said, do what? And he says, yes, Mrs. Clark, the teacher. And Clifton came home and didn't say anything. But school days, oh, they were awful. We used to get called black bastards. We used to get called niggers. I'm saying it as it was. We got called black twats. We got told to go back where we come from. When we were in the classroom, we got persecuted. So I went the morning with him to this school. And I, his teacher named Mr. Walker. I said, where is Mr. Walker? <laughs> And when did you hear me say it, you see everybody there fun. <laughs> show who Mr. Walker is. The teachers would say stuff to me like, look at her, look, black people, they're all dunce. And send me to the back of the classroom, right? But I couldn't read or write. As Mr. Walker came out, I'm sorry, Mrs. Clark, I'm sorry. It won't happen again. I say, it, it won't. I say, you don't kick your dog, don't kick my child. But when it's all come out now, when I went back to uni, I've got dyslexia and dyspraxia really bad, really bad. And they said to me, they didn't even know I was going to get my degree, but I got it. You see, I said, it won't happen again. I said, don't kick my child. You see, say, oh, no, it won't happen again. And then I never get any more complaint from that. From primary school, I was at a Catholic school where I was the only 
black pupil in my year, going through the years. In lower years, there were others, and they started to filter through um, as the years went on, but I was the only one. And I remember some minor experiences, but I think purposefully I haven't given it too much weight. It's not important. It was so minor and minuscule that, as far as I'm concerned, I don't want that to shape who, who I am, who I am today. You've got to be fair and say that there was quite a lot of um, love, in a way. There was um, a lot of people who just cared for children and just wanted to see the best done for those children. But they were doing it within a system that was systematically prejudiced towards uh, those children. There was a few teachers that did understand, but they got a backlash from these other teachers. It was like, oh, you're too close to these guys and you're too friendly with these people and you're not supposed to be. Where we thought, no, they understand us and they're giving us an opportunity to express ourselves in the right manner. In fact, your Mrs. Green and your Mrs. France would come to our, our community centres and listen to our reggae music where none of the teachers would do anything of that nature. The only thing I would say is that and I don't know whether it's linked to race, was that I didn't feel as though the school or the college pushed me or gave me the confidence that I needed, I think, to move on to the next stage. I didn't feel as though they had faith in, in my ability. That's what I'd say. So but I can't say it's, it's specific to me. So where do you think you're self-determination and confidence came from them? I would say it came from parents, it came from my dad in particular, who, uh, you know, his mantra is very much, you know, you are disadvantaged in three ways. You're black, you're female, and you're working class. And you have to work harder, much harder, than your white counterpart. You must, at every stage, at every juncture, you must work harder. And I think at the time, going through school, I didn't see that. It, it didn't play out for me. It's only later on in life, as I've become an adult, as I've become a mother, that I've realised the importance of, of what he said to me back then. In resistance to the impact of education policy, supplementary schools have always been a feature of Huddersfield's African Caribbean and now British African Caribbean communities. He also felt that there was uh, underachievement of um, young black boys, black girls in schools um, in terms of maths and English. So we decided to uh, establish a supplementary school. Uh, the supplementary school was for children aged from uh, five upwards to 16 years, and it ran for 14 years. We were funded by Kirklees Council and um, they saw us as a serious uh, provider of uh, supplementary education. There were other schools in the community as well, um, which, uh, you know, which I must say, um, they did exist and they also provided the service. Well, there was a number of different reasons as to why the school was actually set up. Uh, myself and my co-founder, Linda, um, Linda has a daughter that was exceptionally gifted within school, but I'll let Linda explain her story. But my story is about having a young black male child going through the education system. I understand that he's going to have a few challenges to, to go through, and I need to understand how I can, as his parent, best support him to navigate those different situations that I know he's going to find himself in. Glad to say that many went on uh, to uh, take on careers. We have some who went on to be lawyers, um, social workers, probation officers, business managers, tradespeople, um, so many different, different areas. Um, and, you know, uh, I think we can look back and say that, well, you know, thank God, um, and to God be the glory, we were able to um, provide a need at that time. The school runs once a month and it runs on the last Saturday of every month here at the University of Huddersfield. 
We have field trips, we go to museums, we go to adventure parks, went to Magna, learnt about um, earth, water, fire, air, applying it to their learning here. So yeah, we get out, we, we do what we've got to do, the children enjoy things, um, there's different age groups, some are at different levels of ability, um, the, the ones that are more able often help the younger ones and it's a real um, team effort. Um, but what we felt was important was to provide children, Af particularly of African Caribbean descent, with a sense of um, belonging, with a sense of knowing where they're coming from. Because if you don't know where you're coming from, you certainly can't know where you're going. It also helped to give them a sense of confidence. Um, and we taught them maths and English. Maths and English, the two most basic subjects which any profession, any career, any, prof uh, any sort of uh, establishment would expect you to have in terms of basic skills. So we taught them those studies and um, we basically taught them to be able to compete with um, white counterparts, with the world as it is and as, as it was. I, I just feel such a sense of pride and, and um, just to know how gifted, talented and wonderful our young people are. Um, I'm doing this because I'm a parent and there was nowhere for my child to go. So I thought, okay, there's nowhere to go, I'll create it myself. The children are building networks with other children like them. They're seeing people that look like them, that are teaching them, because it's really important that we have the right role models for our children. And within the education system, they, they tend to lack role models that look like them. So they tend to lack teachers that look like them in terms of their, their skin colour. And so it's really important that we get members of the community to come in and support our children. And the aim is to make sure that we can at least impact in their future. Teach them more about our heritage, our history, make them feel confident and proud, which is something that we observe that some of them do lack, especially with their identity. So, you know, that, uh, that's one of the key reasons why I'm involved. And I said, it's just a little bit of my time, you know, um, contributing to their learning. What we felt was that if we brought our children here from a young age, and we're getting children as young as five that are attending the school based at the university, if they're coming from the age of five all the way up to the age of 16, once they are ready to come to a, an establishment like this, they're not going to be intimidated. They're going to feel very much at place and in the surroundings and they're going to also feel part of the community because what we ultimately want is our children to come along to this establishment. We don't necessarily want them to go to Leeds or to Bradford or to Manchester because uh, Huddersfield, as I say, has a, well, uh, sorry, has a world ra worldwide reputation. It's a very good university and we want our children really to stay here, to stay local and to support the university. It's important for our children to understand these places are for them just as they are for everybody else. And if our children, as I say, are coming here from the age of five, by the time they get to 18, they're gonna feel very, very, very comfortable and at home in establishments like this. This new emerging British-born African Caribbeans took music, dance, sound system and culture, Rastafarianism, to define and describe their identity. Um, this would have been the late 70s. So a lot of the youths, a lot of the black youths in the UK followed Rasta. There was Rasta. It was, you know, it was an identity, something that we could identify with. Um, so we had family throughout the country. We went through the same pass. We faced racism and oppression from the police and from society. So it was a way of like banding together. But it was a peaceful, it wasn't, 
You know, it wasn't a violent, you know, way of life. It was a peaceful way of life, but we, we looked after each other and we looked after ourselves. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't, I've, I've never had locks. I think I started locks and my mum gave me the warning. If they're not off by, the fall, by tomorrow morning, you're out of this house. And I remember how I started the locks because I used to have my hair plait all the time. So I just took the plaits out and left it and it was starting to form. No, it wasn't having it. <laughs> it was not having it. <laughs> so for young ones like me, Teapot Chapel was, was good to a certain age, yeah, and a certain time, and then I had to go yard. Yeah. But I remember going to Teapot Chapel, and I used to see enough man with dreadlocks, you know, and I remember wearing a hat, you know, <laughs> like I'm some dread, you know, and I'm bouncing <laughs> up the road like this. And there was this, you know, the back of it's going huddle. <coughs> and I bounce up and down like that. And I remember this white man and his youth was in the car laughing at me. And you know what, when I look back now, yeah, I had a laugh as well. Because I was hopping big time, you know, just to make the back of this hat go. <laughs> and later on, as you know, I turned dread. <laughs> right? In them times, we was the voice of the black youth in them times. So we were very militant, we were very militant them times. And that showed in the music that we played, how we carried ourselves, the sound system, how we identified ourselves. And, and because we faced so much racism and prejudice, this was our outlet and this was our way that we could, you know, I won't say fight the system, but just, just stand up to the system. Was we built a sound, the sound was called um, Classic. Uh, we played in Amsterdam. I'm going too far, I'm going way ahead of myself now. That's where it ended up. We, we, we started playing at parties. We started playing at Christians and weddings. We started getting a good name for ourselves. Um, I'll never forget um, one of the big, uh, a big dance we played. We've even played, my daughters don't even believe me when I say I played with Saxon sound and stuff like that. So this is the early 80s now. This is when the sound was peaking. Amagidian sound was, was um, 12 tribes. So within the Rastafarian movement, there's different, different, um, different sets, you can say, of Rastas. We follow 12 tribes, 12 tribes of Israel. If you read your Bible, it tells you about the 12 tribes of Israel. You had your Earth Rockers, you had your Jashakas, you had um, the Django. Warrika, there was Aital Warrior, there was Kingston Rock. There was Natty Dread, there was Mr. Tremble, there was King Ayman, who was a resident sound at Venn Street. And then we came after, so after that era, although them guys were still playing out and we used to compete against them guys, them guys were older than us. So after that time, there was us, Amagidian, there was King Maestro, um, and then various, various other sounds came after that. So them times, our main rivals was King Maestro and Earth Rocker. I also remember um, when the, the sound guys and used to ring Huddersfield when they were in Doventer in, um, in, 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 in London, in London yeah. and they would be playing the music on the phone and we would be telling them, get that one, get that one, no, no, not that one, that one, that one. And we were the one, the females, and that actually chose the music that they played in the, um, in the, in the dance because most of the dance, if you remember, were fill up pure female and it was our dance and we chose the music and when they win their, their um, the, the competition is through the girls. Um, so we were the one that really we, um, chose the music that they carried. Mm -hmm. It's true, very true, very true. They have to play for the females, mm -hmm. yes. My era was Mount Zion, Armageddon. Um, that was it really, and us. Was there another sound? No, it was roughly, those were the sounds. And I'd say the best sound was Armageddon. Reason being, they came with a culture tip. And the culture tip just calmed everybody down. It was unbelievable what it did in those times. It will bring us closer together because we can reminisce together. We can probably look back again and how to keep us happy because at the moment I don't think enough culture is out there to, um, to bring the love. So it will remind us of how um, the blues were like and how we went for a cuddle and how we went for loving and, and you know, reminds us of how the children were conceived through this love, you know, that, that we are losing in our community. It, was a, it, it kept us grounded. You know, the 12 tribes and the Rasta kept us grounded because if it wasn't for 12 tribes and if it wasn't for sound system, a lot of us would have done a, 
prison sentences. We have spent a lot of time in jail, but that kept us focused. You know, it kept us focused and it, and it kept us living correctly amongst us friends, as, you know, even as enemies, you know. It, says it shows in the Bible about loving your enemies, which we, we shows enemies love as much as what we could. But it kept us grounded and it kept us out of jail. My dad was the treasurer of the, I think it was the West Indian Association, a group of busmen who first set up um, Ben Street. I think it has had a few names, but what we know as Ben Street. And then my uncle bought that uh, in the early 90s, late 80s. And then uh, it became Cleopatra's and I was involved through my uncle. You'd go there and have a very good time, but it was also a place where you you found your identity because you grew up with your, with your own community and your parents used to go to the club and then you followed suit and most people who would go there would probably know each other so it's very much a community affair and you can guarantee that you were going to be having a good time. To my knowledge, I know there was Pinnock, Babs and some of the black men who worked on the buses. I think when Sparrow Park closed down, they needed a spot to socialise and they got together at least the building we know as Venn Street. The artists that came, the big name artists at the time that came, they didn't go to any of the major towns or cities, they came to Huddersfield. At the Errol Bob, which is a very well-known man in the town, he was a bit more, a bit more flamboyance about him and started to bring real artists to Venn Street. So instead of just you know, the local domino scene, he started to bring in international artists. He brought Desmond Decker and Millie Small. Dennis Brown to Wailing Souls. The Mighty Diamonds, the Gregory Isaacs, the Dennis Browns, your Freddie McGregor, your Frankie Paul, Delroy Wilson, Twinkle Brothers, many, many more. Even the big British bands, Carol Thompson, Janet Kay, Aswad, that was a big feature as well. Yeah, Huddersfield without Ben Street right now, it's left a whole community without a real meeting place. You know, and that Ben Street covered everything. Christenings, weddings, funerals, the lot. And then the good times, you know, with the bands. You know, it was everything. It, it was a place where everybody, you know, 90-80% of the, the Afro-Caribbean population would be in Venn Street. That's the place we all met, the elders, the, the next generation, the youngsters, the ones in the middle. Um, that's what Venn Street was. It was like a social centre for the community. At the time when Venn Street closed down, people just took it for granted that it'd always be there. And the support was intermittent. And then when the actual demolition order came and then it really closed down, People realised that they, 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 they were complacent about something that had real meaning in town. But there was not, nobody collectively got together to try and save the place. It just, you know, people started going to different nightclubs, different scenes and didn't support what, what was going on here and it, it, it just died. It's very difficult for the youth to sort of go anywhere and call anywhere directly their own with you know somewhere where they can go and listen to the music that they love and enjoy to listen to you know so i'd say losing a place like venn street is a major deal in this town because the youths there are you know they're, they're the second and third generation that are actually missing out on having something to call their own huddersfield has had over 50 years of caribbean carnival history huddersfield's local newspaper the examiner headlines in 1968 was Immigrants to stage Caribbean type carnival and the first of its kind in the town. It wasn't until 1974 whereby Huddersfield would see any representation of Caribbean carnival with just a single float in the Lord Mayor's parade. Since then, the Huddersfield carnival has been the standout cultural celebration in Huddersfield, attracting up to 30,000 people to watch the processions. 
carnival has brought a new form of emancipation and celebration to the African Caribbean communities. Assessing vibrancy and the celebration of African Caribbean heritage, tradition, rituals, culture, fashion, food and music. If you look at the carnival, that one single event, you will see and feel the richness of our communities, the multiple different languages from the islands here in Huddersfield. The cultural dress, dance, music, food, styles of non-verbal and verbal communication, the cultural expressions of our collective heritage, rituals, traditions and customs of love, friendship and togetherness is as strong as it ever was in our communities and that is worth celebrating. We love life and we love people. African Caribbean led organizations, businesses, and over 60 years of sustained civic engagement both to the town and multiple communities is a testimony of their ambition and determination to succeed in spite of overwhelming odds. We have uh, organisations still going today that were founded in those times uh, out of a you know, out of a necessity really. So for example, we've still got Antilles Social Club um, up near the park uh, where a group of Caribbean immigrants came together, put some money together and started a social club, you know, because we were made welcome in other places. And we have lots of uh, examples of that. For example, you know, Leeds Carnival, Huddersfield Carnival, uh, and those things are still going today. So obviously this, there's still that sense of community there and what I would say is there's probably not enough people engaged in trying to move the African descent community forward uh, in Kirklees. As the current generation hands over to the next, what are the hopes and aspirations for the next generation? I'd say my first recommendation would be for mentors or community leaders to come together and create an environment or come up with a, a way of galvanising the community to move in the right direction. We've been here so long. Years gone by when we were having all sorts of obstruction and what we were standing for, you know, and we this and we had this. But first you have to help yourself. I feel if we can show that we can um, sustain something or do something, they may help us, they may not, but once we've sustained and shown that we can do something, we might not need their help. We might not need their help at all, you know? Yes, the council are there and they should see what we do and support us, but sometimes we're our own worst enemy. I've always thought that what's really impressive about um, uh, African Caribbean people uh, in Huddersfield, which is where I know particularly is just the sheer range of things that they're doing, um, the sheer number of activities they're carrying out to, to create a sense of pride in the place that they live in. My hope for the community for Huddersfield is that people will see themselves not as a Jamaican or a Grenadian, but as somebody in England enjoying the beauty of the country, working together in unity and helping each other. You know, we have a, a diverse and rich culture in the Afro-Caribbean community and, and they've been here for around 70 years and they are part and parcel on the fabric of this community. Um, and one thing I really enjoy when I go to not just Afro-Caribbean communities but other communities is, is, you know, the bottom line to me is they are just normal people. Uh, it's very unfortunate that we are where we are regarding the Venus situation. Today's African Caribbean community and, and the, their young people, I'm not going to tar all of them with the same brush. I think some of them needs to just sit up and think, what foundation am I standing on? Because I think they ought to be um, grateful or to be or recognize that somebody else 
like our forefathers who went through slavery, etc., etc., they ought to recognize that the older generation had made a pathway. For example, the, the kind of art they, they bring to the area, the kind of food they bring to the area, and the kind of culture they bring to the area, you know, adds to that richness and uh, adds value to the whole community. So, so they've got a very strong legacy, they've got a very strong baseline. What I want to do is make sure we build on that and build for the future. Okay, we didn't get everything that we wanted or fought for everything that we wanted. But if we didn't make that pathway, they wouldn't be able to be even employed by the council. Although I know some of them had restrictions on. Sometimes a similar activity event being done by one group one week and another group the next week. And people saying, this is terrible, we should work together more. But actually all that, that sense of creativity and that sense of activity and that sense of offering something to society is incredibly impressive. So we really, really need to get involved in ourselves, to really to trust each other, and don't believe the things that we were told, our four parents was told about not trusting each other. Um, I think one of, the, one of the issues that we face today, and, and hopefully projects like After Windrush will help um, counter, is this dislocation between the, the 60s and 70s communities, these clusters, these, these associations are almost represented a, a safety net, but also a retreat from engaging beyond the wider, the wider community. My sort of um, guide to young people or whatever is to um, give yourself breathing space to think. Think through your decisions before you act, because they can be um, they can live with you for the whole of your life. I remember the days of family, the importance of family, and we we were strong when we all lived together in family. I think the family is the key um, for black communities because not only that we've been because of slavery we've been denied that opportunity of being good fathers. Um, so we've got the father being responsive to uh, family and the children, helping them to um, sail through these um, sh turbulent times. I think that's what everybody seems to overlook, that we've got um, solutions and we've got ideas, we've got creativity uh, and we can bring that to the table you know everybody seems to see us as a problem rather than a solution uh, but we live here we know what our communities need and we are best placed to serve our communities in many instances so you know it's only right that we have political and public office the word of god said by the sweat of your brow you eat bread so don't rush for it work and it will come
Look them in the eye. 